Thank you very much. And I, I hope that everybody else is ready. Uh, we have at least 15 participants already. <laughs> fantastic, the 15. Uh, the number of participants, 15, yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is the last lecture, lecture four. Um, I'm going to talk about real analyticity of the density matrix. Uh, there will be some technology involved, but I, I, um, I hope it will not be as uh, overwhelming as uh, in the previous lecture. This is why I made it the last one, because the, the third one, I, I wanted to talk, I wanted to tell you about uh, these little tricks that I used in estimating eigenvalues and singular values. And this, of course, leads to some, to some technicalities. All right, so um, just give me a sec. All right, real analyticity of density matrix. So this is what you, uh, you have seen a few times before, but uh, nevertheless, this is Schrodinger operator. This is V, right? So that's the notation I'm going to use for V instead of writing all this uh, again uh, later, uh, we remember that. Uh, this is the one particle density matrix. So it is integrated out over variables, um, um, oh, x, x hat variable. And uh, the on the diagonal, this object is called the one particle density. Okay. Uh, and this is a, a, a equally important uh, object in quantum mechanics. <clears throat> I will need this definition later. Okay, so here is the result. This is all we have on this slide, nothing else. Um, the theorem, this is main theorem three from lecture one, uh, tells us that uh, gamma, the function of two variables is real analytic in the variables x, y. So it is, it is real analytic as the function of actually six real variables represented by X and Y on the following set. So X and Y should not be zeros. Both should not be zeros and they should not be on the diagonal. They should not coincide with each other. Okay, so this is away from the diagonal. Uh, well, when I was so, okay, this result is obtained by myself. This is S here and Peter Herrenshaw. This is my PhD student in, at UCL. Um, he's not here because he heard this. Um, I don't know how many times uh, this talk or something like that. Uh, so when we were doing this uh, real analyticity, um, of course, uh, everybody knows what real analytic function is and so on. But uh, we never worked with real analytic functions before, so we had to learn some very elementary stuff. And uh, I decided that I should actually include some of this elementary stuff in the lecture. All right, so this is, this is a mini course, this is not a seminar talk, so I do not assume that everybody knows everything. No, this is the, just the definition of a real analytic function. This is a very simple definition. It tells you that a function is analytic, is said a real analytic if, if, if it can be represented by its Taylor series, by the convergent Taylor series in the neighborhood of which point in the domain. Okay, so this is it. So remember those coefficients. So it is Taylor series, the notation here M is the uh, collection of variables. Okay, uh, so this is a vector as well. Um, as you, well, it is all set here. <clears throat> so this is the uh, this is the notation I'm going to use. Um, and the important test for real analyticity, or actually not a test, this is characterization of real analyticity is this, if and only if, you see, that if you can, in a, in, neighborhood of, in a neighborhood of every point, if you can estimate all the derivatives by this, where M is this factorial that I'm writing here, and this is just a certain constant, fixed constant to this power, um, 
if you can estimate by that, then you can guarantee that the function is real analytic in the domain. Notice that in this in this lecture, I, I'm not using this this notation anymore uh, because this notation ignores the constants and they are there, but we don't want, need to know what they are. Well, now because of this estimate, we need to follow. We need to keep track of the constants. So I'm going to use C A and all this sort of stuff. So I'm going to use this uh, proper proper notation, proper inequalities. Now the important thing for for well for me personally uh, was was this bound here, that uh, instead of this bound that you saw on the previous slide that involved m factorial, you can actually estimate the function by uh, by this power, just m to power m. Okay. You can estimate it by that, and it will be enough for real analyticity. And here I just uh, give, it is not characterization, although it can be converted into one, but I just give a simplified version of that. If at every point you have this bound, okay, with the constant which, with the constants that are independent on the point, C and A, then you have real analyticity. Um, let me just skip the proof. This is a really straightforward proof. Of course, uh, everybody can see that it is based on the on Stirling's formula. There is nothing else behind that. <clears throat> so uh, this is what is very convenient for practical applications. If you look at the uh, differential equations books uh, or elliptic equations books, you, you will see that exactly this bound is used in the proofs. <clears throat> And I will need uh, a different type of estimate that will also imply real analyticity. Of course, uh, if you prove, for example, an L1 estimate instead of the maximum of the, uh, of the function is bounded by that, you can prove L1 estimate. And that will also imply real analyticity because you can extract maximum, of course, <laughs> using Fourier transform, if you wish. Or you can say embedding theorems. Um, you can use that to prove real analyticity. So this is very convenient practically as well. Instead of maximum, we can do L1 norm. This is what we will apply. Uh, okay, so this should be true for all M. So as I said, I repeat, uh, tracking down the constants is crucial for the proofs. Okay. Um, Let's go on. Now, uh, let's get down to the proof. <clears throat> I will make a few simplifying assumptions. The first simplifying assumption is that instead of this function, I'm going to look at the density only. Uh, the proof for, for this function is more sophisticated. One has to explain a few more things that probably will obscure uh, calculations in this lecture. So uh, I have decided, after much hesitation, <laughs> I have decided to do just the uh, um, density, one particle density. So this is on the diagonal. So what is one particle density? Oh, excuse me, another simplifying assumption. I, as on, in the previous lecture, I am looking only at two particles. So I have two coordinates, x1 and x2. And in this case, the uh, um, one particle density is just the integral of, uh, of this function, the eigenfunction in the in variable x1. Okay, so it depends only on x2. And uh, our aim is to show that if we take, if we step away <coughs> from the origin, if we step away from the origin, uh, then uh, in order to use this corollary, you remember, to prove real analyticity, then on this domain, x2 greater than two epsilon, this function is going to be real analytic, the function rho. Uh, and for that, we need to prove, it is, so it's a, it is sufficient to prove this bound with some constant a for all m 
for all indices m. <clears throat> and a, of course, will depend on epsilon. But here we don't care about this. In contrast to the previous lecture, we are not going to be interested in the dependence on epsilon because real analyticity will be just a qualitative result okay, for us. Okay, uh, what do we do next? Now, the reason why I'm talking um, in this lecture about real analyticity, uh, not everybody does quantum mechanics, not everybody is interested in uh, functions of several variables. Uh, I mean, multi-particle Schrodinger operator and so on. But uh, there is one message behind all that that I would like to convey in this, in this lecture. Look at this function here. This function, so we integrate in x1, right? x2 is the variable. This function we know is singular on the diagonal. You remember this x1 minus x2 factor from the previous lecture. So it is singular. How come that after integration we get a real analytic function? That's the question. Well, so this is the message that I would like to convey. There is a trick. There is the method that allows you to circumvent this difference, uh, this difficulty. Uh, and to, to show that due to the integration, all the singularities, they just disappear and the resulting function is real analytic. So, and this is the method, uh, which, is, which is not mine, because for this, for this function, it was done before. This method allows you to uh, still to claim real analyticity in spite of local singularities of the function underneath the integral. Okay, so uh, let me just start doing this uh, to ex start explaining what method it is. Now, if we want to differentiate with respect to x2, suppose that we just differentiate this integral just like we do uh, when we need to. So we, if we want to take differentiation, let's say first differentiation through to the variable x2, then it will be okay, assuming that the variables are separated, x1 and x2 are separated. You remember this factor? If we ensure that x1 and x2 stay apart, then of course we have, we have smoothness, no problem. So on this domain, so if we restrict the integration, this integration to this domain, u2, then we have smoothness in x2. It is a already a different question whether it is real analyticity, but smoothness indeed ensured if we integrate this function over the domain u2, this function over the domain u2 instead of the whole space, okay? Right, so suppose that we have on the other domain where x1 and x2 are not separated when they are close to each other, what do we do? We are, going, we are not going to differentiate with respect to x2. We are going to differentiate with respect to the sum of variables, <clears throat> right? Now let me remind you. So the function, this function has singularity on the diagonal because of this potential. It is written down there on the slide here because of this potential, right? So where, so the singularity of the solution of the differential equations comes from the singularity of the coefficient. <clears throat> All right, but what if we use a different type of derivative? What if we differentiate with, the, with respect to the sum like this of variables one and two, then the derivative of this potential is just zero. Well, distributional derivative, it is just zero because this depends on the sum and this depends on the difference. <laughs> so, but for this trivial reason, you just have zero derivative. So there is no singularity. If you differentiate with respect to the sum, there is no singularity. And therefore the solution of the equation will be also smooth on that domain, on this one. It will be also smooth in this variable, in the sum of two variables, okay? 
So there are two domains. So what we will do, we will split this integral into several integrals over domains of this type. And on each of those domains, we are going to use different derivatives. Here, we will differentiate with respect to x2, straightforward, we can do that. And here, we will differentiate with respect to the sum. And I will, I will show you the first steps of this differentiation for, for small values of m. So you will see how it works. Okay, so the first theorem here is about the potential itself. You remember the notation V. So this notation V includes the nuclear interaction. So it is one over X one, one over X X, right? And it also includes one over X one minus X two, this potential. So uh, look what we have here. This is actually a good estimate. This is something that we need for analyticity. <clears throat> V is a Coulomb potential after all, um, right? I mean, or the sum of Coulomb potential. So this is a real analytic outside uh, of singularities. And therefore we have this sort of bound. Now, what domain is it is U of epsilon? I told you that we need to use different domains if we want to avoid singularities. So if we have no differentiation with respect to sum, so this term is zero. We differentiate only with respect to x2. Then of course, we will need to ensure that particles are separated, right? And this is exactly u2. So x1 minus x2 is uh, separated for this case. For this case, um, if there is no differentiation with respect to x2, we need to take the other domain where x1 and x2 are close to each other. <clears throat> so we have the sum, differentiation with respect to the sum of variables. And then we have this. Um, I'm not going to prove that. This is just follows from real identity of, of, the, of the Coulomb potential. Oh, okay, well, the last case I didn't mention, but this is really straightforward now, that if we have both variable, uh, both derivatives present, then we have to take the intersection of those two. Okay. Can we take the intersection? Okay, let me just leave it. And uh, now, uh, before I before we uh, start talking about the function rho, the density, uh, let me talk about the derivatives of the function psi with respect to both of those things, both of those variables. Now, this function uh, is actually uh, a solution of some differential equation. So H is this uh, Schrodinger operator. E is the eigenvalue associated with psi. And now if you, if you substitute this in this formula, then uh, what you can do, you can actually uh, try to commute those things just using, use the fact that H psi is equal to E psi. This is what we're going to use here. And once you do this computation, you see there is also the commutator of, what, what remains is a commutator of V with those derivatives. And uh, this can be expanded using Leibniz rule for multi-indices for partial differentiation um, into this formula. You don't need to understand all the details of this formula. What is important here is that uh, if here you have M and N, so the total, the total, uh, order of differentiation will be m plus n. Then on the right hand side, the total load of order of differentiation is at most m plus n minus one. So we reduce the order of differentiation on the right hand side. Okay, so this is going to be the right hand side of the equation. And this consideration that the order of differentiation is reduced opens the door to induction. Right? So we can always increase the order of differentiation 
right? Using this formula here, we need m plus n minus one. We get information for m plus n and so on and so forth. This is so this is this will provide the induction step. I'm not going to run this induction, but I'm just showing to you why it is possible. Okay, so this is the solution of this equation. And using this observation, we uh, we can prove, uh, we can prove, um, I will not do that, I will just show you the formula that um, these integrals, these integrals satisfy the right bound. And you remember, these are exactly the integrals that we need. You remember L1 integral for, for this function um, or for the derivatives of this function. <clears throat> Now here, um, I write this in a slightly different form. Here you see I differentiate psi, but here this is the modulus. It is more convenient to have the derivatives for modulus already because rho is defined by the modulus squared, right? Modulus squared here as well. Not, it is just straightforward, uh, straightforward consequence of this formula. Okay, with some coefficients a1, a2. Now, I, I'm not going to go into details. So what, I, what I'm saying is that uh, the proof is from now on for these derivatives, once you understood that you need to use these directional derivatives instead of derivatives with respect to x2, sometimes x1 plus x2 is needed derivative with respect to this new variable. Once you understood that, now you can run a relatively standard method of proving regularity of or real analyticity of solutions for different elliptic equations with analytic coefficients. And this is something which you can find in the books. I found it, I mean, I, I was using Hermander's book on um, partial differential equations. And there's, there is the argument that tells you, that explains why the solution is real analytic. And this is something that we, that is done here as well. This is a very similar argument. And it is based on it just very well known to everybody in this audience, I'm sure, elliptic estimate. So if you want the estimate of the, sorry, this is a solution U of some elliptic equation, then you have, uh, what is that? This is H2, H2 norm, so second derivative. It is bounded by a constant then you have the right hand side l2 norm of the right hand side this is f plus uh, the norm of u in h1 right so but this is on the domain and this is on a slightly smaller domain you remember that this is what you get for the peak equation so if you are in st petersburg you open ladizhinsky's book if you are elsewhere, you open Gilbert and Trudinger or Evans book. <laughs> so this, this is the standard book. However, for the uh, for analyticity, we need to keep track of of this dependence of of this constant on this domain. Uh, so this is what is done here. You see, it is not just epsilon; it is epsilon plus delta, which is a smaller domain than u epsilon. You see, it is smaller domain. Uh, and the dependence on this parameter delta is here. Okay, uh, I'm <laughs> this is something which is done in Hermander as well. And it is done in that paper that I, I mentioned before, Furne, Hoffman, Ostenhoff, Furne, Hoffman, Ostenhoff, and Sorensen. Okay, again, I think it is 2004. This is what they did for the uh, electron density. <clears throat> right, um, now uh, let's do a very straightforward calculation. What I do here, I introduce, so this is proof now of the, uh, of the analyticity. One formula one is exactly the formula for the derivatives of the uh, density in L2, in L1 norm. Right, this is x2 greater than two epsilon. And then on the right-hand side, I have a, I think it was a m plus one 
m plus one. This is a, excuse me. And then one plus m to power m. This is the bound that I want to prove now. And as I said, um, there are two cases, right? X1 and X2 close to each other, X1 and X2 separated. So to do, to separate those guys, I need to do this. I need to take uh, a cutoff function. So this is the function that keeps them together. You can see X is less than epsilon, uh, epsilon over eight, uh, it is one. And the complementary function that separates them is omega. This is very similar to what I used in the previous lecture. But now I do not reflect the dependence on epsilon here because I said it is irrelevant for this, for this um, argument. Now, uh, of course I can now split rho like that. You can see. Um, so this keeps them together, this two, and this keeps them separated. And uh, this splits rho into two bits uh, and each of these bits will be estimated separately. Uh, let's see how it is done. So on the next page, I think I'm dealing with, with this component. Yes, indeed. So uh, the first thing, of course, you remember that now x1 and x2 are closed. So we need to aim to use the directional derivative with respect to the sum. So uh, for that, to that end, I will just introduce a new variable of integration. <clears throat> okay, so new variable, as you can see, is x1 minus x2 or x2 minus x1. I cannot think about it. I think that, no, this one, sorry. So that x1 is x2 plus t. And this is exactly what I have here. And I integrate in t, right? So here I don't have any x1 or x2. I integrate in t. Now let's differentiate. Uh, here, it is a bit complicated notation, but I, uh, I thought that it, I hope it will be clear. This is just first order derivative. First order partial derivative with respect to one of the components of x2, okay? This is the standard notation. Uh, I understand, I mean, this is, this is sometimes a pain because you see, you have variables x1, x2 that are already three dimensional. And then if you start writing partial derivatives with respect to components of those variables, then the notation becomes horrendous. So this is what I, I wanted to avoid. So here, this is the differentiation with respect to one of the components of X2, right? This is first order differentiation. <clears throat> now, uh, look at that. We have to differentiate both terms, right? We have to differentiate with respect to first variable, with, depending on X2 as well and with respect to the second variable. So this gives us exactly the differentiation with respect to the sum of variables, if we convert it back to the integration in X1, okay? So this now, in spite of the fact that X2 and X1 are close, we have a good bound for this. We have a good bound for this from, the, from here. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, all right, I unveiled everything now. So for this, we have the bound uh, that follows from that theorem. This, if this is the first order derivative, <clears throat> then we have the bound of this type, uh, which looks a bit silly, but I just want to show that I'm, I'm using, uh, the constants are okay. I mean, this is one plus order of derivative to the power of order of derivatives. Um, so, uh, and if you can, if you look at this formula, so this is the formula for derivative M for the first order derivatives. Now, if you look at this formula and you want to differentiate again, you can do exactly, well, actually you, you don't even have to return to this form. You differentiate again with respect to X2 and you will get exactly the same formula. So if you have Zeta here in the function, in the, in the integral, then you can always differentiate with respect to the sum of variables and get the right bound. 
So this term is easy. It gives you everything straight away. Uh, so far, so good. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. Uh, just for slides left. Okay. So, <laughs> not to worry. <clears throat> so, this term is easy because of this fact that you can always keep it in this form. And um, it gives you the bound of the required form for all. Uh, orders of differentiation. <clears throat> okay, now, actually, this is the last slide. Uh, it looks like there are 13, but I actually cut off three of them. So this is the last slide. Anyway, my before, no, I'm okay. Now the second term, you remember, the second term, it contains this uh, cutoff uh, omega. So this is the integral of uh, psi x1, x2 squared omega x1, x2. So these are separated now. x1 and x2 are separated. <clears throat> uh, right. Let me do one more thing before I talk about this term. Let me go back. To this formula. Notice that in this formula here, as I said, this formula holds for all orders of derivatives m. And therefore, to get this bound, we will need to know only the derivatives of the function psi. The function zeta enters just as itself. There are no derivatives. So what we will need just the to estimate the maximal value of the function, okay? My message is that once you start differentiating things like that, or differentiating things like that, the danger is uh, that you will start differentiating this function as well, and then you will have all orders of derivatives of this function. And because this function cannot be real analytic, you have bad estimates for these derivatives. So real analyticity, if you go this route down this road, then you will lose real analyticity or you will not catch it because this function is not real analytic. The argument that I just presented allows you to avoid that because you don't differentiate the function zeta. You differentiate only the function that has a good bound uh, when it comes to real analyticity. So the next term that I'm going to show to you doesn't have this advantage. This term, as you can see, here the variable separated. So we differentiate with respect to the sum. We don't differentiate with respect to the sum. We differentiate with respect to x2. <clears throat> and uh, this gives us the derivative estimate, which is bad. Right? The derivative estimate. So, uh, but for this first order derivative, we can still get a good bound. This is a good bound for it, right? So this is bounded by a constant, this constant. So this is L2 bound, this is L2 bound again. And we get, we get from the theorem that I stated before for the, from the bounds for these functions, we get uh, finally the bound for this component of the density, right? So it's still okay, but look what will happen later. But so if we keep differentiating with respect to X2, we will get higher order derivatives. How to avoid that? And well, higher order derivatives are bad for our estimates. How to avoid that? Well, we will use the fact that once you differentiate this function, it becomes the function with compact support. <laughs> and on the support of this function, you have this bound here. So x1 and x2 are close to each other again. And if they're close to each other, then you can use the argument that we used in the pre on, the, on the previous slide, right? we can differentiate with respect to the sum. 
and this is what I write here. And the second term, we can use differentiation with respect to the sum. Uh, let me explain myself again. For the first derivative, you don't need to do anything. You just do as, as exactly, uh, exactly as shown. However, when you differentiate further, you will need to use this trick. You will have to take into account that this two x1 minus x2 are close in this integral and use differentiation with respect to the sum instead of differentiation with respect to x2. So once you start increasing the order of derivative, you will have to be uh, to be careful about these integrals. This one is estimated using d12, and this one is estimated using dx2. And this is 1, 2, and this is d2. Okay, And you will keep getting terms like that at every differentiation, and but you, you, one can keep track of those terms. Well, uh, this is best done using just uh, the induction. So this is the only problem that you face when you differentiate with respect to x2, this integral with omega here. But it all can be over, um, overcome and the result will follow. Uh, I hope that you are still okay. <laughs> And guess what? This is the very last line. Uh, when the number of particles is arbitrary, then instead of these two cutoff functions, we will have to introduce very complicated functions that put two variables together, the others apart, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So the, the, all possible configuration, or as we call them, uh, with Peter, we call them clusters. It might not be the exact definition of clusters, but nevertheless, when particles are close to each other, we call them clusters. When they are apart, uh, they belong to different clusters. So uh, this, this is all possible to deal with arbitrary cutoffs associated with various clusters of particles. And the same argument works, but it becomes really very technical but if, we, if one understands the, uh, the general strategy, then it is all doable. And I believe, yeah, I believe that this is the end of it. So I even finished slightly before the time. I'm very proud of myself. Thank you very much, so much. for surviving all that. Uh, <laughs> I don't hear anything that Sasha is saying because he is muted. Uh, yes. Addressing to uh, uh, all the uh, people uh, who have attended the lecture, uh, uh, do you have some questions, remarks, comments? No. So Over, let us oh, thank okay. then uh, uh, Professor Sobolev for his yes. uh, top level, outstanding, very clear, fantastic, interesting fantastic. and instructive. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. thank you all for coming guys I, and it was it was really nice it was uh, really great to see you all here to, to, to attend your lectures thank thanks you. a lot yes I'm, I'm and thank you for staying with me because i see you know the audience is more or less the same as last time so i'm i'm very pleased and grateful to all of you it is good yeah nice Okay, um, that's that's the end of the mini course. <laughs> All right, okay, there's some something in the chat. Mm -hmm. There are some, some ah, okay. in the chat. Mm -hmm. Спасибо, спасибо. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so what what are we going to do now? I, I think I will uh, what what are we going to do now? Yeah. If uh, let me just stop sharing here. If you send us uh, your lectures, we put yeah. it uh, on the web page of the program. Yeah, I will. I will send all the slides. I think okay. I will do it. Uh, well, essentially now. Maybe uh, I edit uh, today uh, today's course and put it also on the page uh, of the uh, of the program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And for the last time, I think it will be Ananievsky, uh, vice director of the earlier institute, who will help us to put to, to get to get the recordings and uh, to, to, to uh, and, we, and then okay, we cool. put it on the... Very good. Yeah. Okay. Superb.
Okay, so uh, let's... Uh... Alex, uh, I wanted to say thank you. You okay. had a very uh, small uh, member I of see, audience. Uh, I see, but very grateful participant here. I see that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Yanni. <laughs> sure. I'll see you later. Uh, see you later. Take Thanks care, a lot. Bye. Bye. Yeah, you see, people come with small children <laughs> just <laughs> to, to, my, to my lectures. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> That's very nice. Okay, well, in this case, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it was good to see you, Valodia. Uh, yeah, Jeff, thank you. Uh, very good to see you. Very nice. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for, for, for giving. To me. <laughs> okay very very good to know that so i i think i will have to disconnect now because okay. i have a few, a few things to take care of by 12 o'clock so thank you thank, thank you. you tanya sasha everybody uh, all the best all the best to you all the best to you sasha mm -hmm.